Well, welcome to our worship service on this, the third Sunday of Advent. It is good to have you with us for the special IT service. And a note of joyful expectation marks today's worship. We wait with patience for the coming of the Lord, even as we rejoice at his presence among us this day in word and also for those who will be in person worshiping in the Holy Supper, in church, in our homes, in silent reflection, and in works of justice and love. We pray that God would open our eyes and ears to the wonders of Christ's advent or coming among us. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Stir up the wills of all who look to you, Lord God, and strengthen our faith in your coming, that, transformed by grace, we may walk in your way through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. share a lesson from the letter of James in the New Testament, as that will be my text for today. It's the prescribed second lesson for the third Sunday of Advent in the calendar year or our liturgical year A. A reading from James. Be patient, therefore, beloved, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Beloved, do not grumble against one another, so that you may not be judged. See the judges standing at the doors. As an example of suffering and patience, beloved, Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Word of God, word of life. Amen. And let us pray. Lord God, we pray that you help us to be a more patient people. Patient with each other, patient with you. May we always trust in your promises, knowing that you will bring the fulfillment about in your own good time. In the interim, may we eagerly and joyfully serve as your disciples. Amen. Patience, as we all know, is said to be a virtue, though we oftentimes seem to lack it, right? I consider myself to be a pretty patient person, 
And I can come up with all kinds of illustrations when I didn't exhibit patience. I remember growing up, for example, I would oftentimes go fishing with my grandfather, Yeiser, and I would tend to be a bit antsy, just throw my line into the water, you know, just kind of uh, sit there and think about the situation that no fish were biting, and in five minutes, ask my grandfather if I could move to another location. And he would admonish me by saying, be patient. You have to be patient. The fish in all probability will bite, but you need to give them some time to do that. Patience is needed in such pursuits as hunting and fishing, in athletic, academic, music, performing arts fields. It's needed. It's needed in the work world. And now during this busy Christmas shopping season, it's needed there as we may be patiently waiting to find the right gift for that someone special in our lives or are called to be patient as we're standing in line waiting to purchase an item. And patience is really called for in our relationships with others our spouses, our children, our parents, other relatives, with our friends. Patience is in order. And when we're patient, we'll find that these various relationships just seem to work a little better, go a little more smoothly. Now, certainly there is a word of caution that we want to send out here and that that is that we don't want to make a virtue patience into a vice. Well, I'll just sit back and just be patient and not have to do anything. Just take it easy, kick my feet up on the lazy boy and not worry about different things that need to be taken care of. No, that would be making patience into a vice, but patience is still for sure a life's asset. Our second lesson, this, this reading from James urges patience as we await the parousia or the second coming of our Lord. The author exhorts Christians to be patient while waiting for this coming of the Lord. The parousia, you see, was expected in the immediate future in early New Testament times. People thought it would come in their own lifetime. It's apparent delay cause some problems of confusion and impatience among Christians. Granted, this text from James may appear to be an appropriate reading for fundamentalist Christians, some of whom are very concerned about pinpointing exactly when the second coming will be and really maybe in some ways over focusing on that one area of God's coming to us. But as Lutherans, maybe we don't think enough about it. Thus, Advent is an important liturgical season. We stress here, as I've said before, three comings of our Lord in the past. When we roll out the carpet and celebrate the birth of our Lord over the 12 great days. In the present, as our Lord comes to us in word and sacrament. And the third coming that we talk about is the future coming of our Lord into our futures, the future of the world, of humanity. Let's not forget about this. James exhorts the Christian community that he is addressing to be patient with wealthy landlords, to be patient in the trials of life, to be patient in the delay of Jesus' return. And then in our own lesson for today, he shares two illustrations encouraging patience. Farmers do well to be patient, awaiting nature to do its work. And the prophets also do well to be patient as they await while God does 
God's work. We also do well to be patient as we await the Lord's second coming. It's an incredible event this second coming will be, to be sure, a stupendous event, far beyond our wildest imaginations, as our Lord's second coming is the final invasion of the earth by heaven and the coming of the king to receive the final submission and adoration of his subjects. His second coming is God appearing to his people and the unveiling of his power and glory upon humanity. The New Testament teaches us that no person knows when this will occur. Even Christ said that he didn't know. Speculation and maybe an over-concentration and really just um, hyper-focusing about the second coming of our Lord and assuming that it will be in our own particular lifetimes is really both vain and blasphemous. The New Testament also teaches us that the parousia will be swift and sudden like lightning and unexpected like a thief coming at night. These teachings of the New Testament urge us to be prepared for the master's return. Do not despair in the interim, knowing that all things are in God's time. To live a holy life as we prepare the way for the second coming of our Lord. To be in fellowship with others. To not grumble about others and blame them for our troubles as people in James Day were doing. We're called to be loving, encouraging, and reconciling, always abiding in Christ. How do we abide in Christ? Through worship, through devotions, through prayers, and through loving actions. John the Baptist prepared the way for our Lord's first coming which did, of course, occur in his own particular lifetime. We are equally blessed and privileged to be able to prepare the way for our Lord's second coming, even if that doesn't occur in our own particular life spans. The second coming means that this world is not purposeless, but rather is going somewhere. For there is one divine event to which the whole creation is moving. As Christians, we have the privilege and the responsibility to proclaim this message to the world as we prepare the way for our Lord's second advent. Amen.
As we prepare for the fullness of Christ's presence, let us pray for a world that yearns for new hope. Gracious God, we rejoice in the gifts of your Spirit. Equip the global church to magnify your love and peace in every land. We pray for the work of the Lutheran World Federation and ELCA Global Mission. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Abundant God, we rejoice in your creation. Revive lands we have squandered and depleted. Make gardens flourish in cities and neighborhoods. Cleanse polluted air and water so living things may breathe, drink, and praise you, God. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Righteous God, we rejoice in your justice. End racism and oppression. Deliver all who are unjustly imprisoned or persecuted. Reconcile nations and peoples in conflict. Help us pray for our enemies. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Healing God, we rejoice in your compassion. Comfort any in distress because of worry, illness, or loss, especially all those we have listed on our prayer list. Strengthen and protect healthcare workers, rescue teams, crisis counselors, and all who risk themselves to keep others safe. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Abiding God, we rejoice in your company. Give us calm and patient hearts as we gather with family and friends. Keep us mindful of those for whom this season is not happy. Console the grieving and surround them with loving support. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, we rejoice with Mary, mother of our Lord, and with all the saints, that your mercy endures for all generations. Look with favor on those who have died and lead us to joyfully sing of your everlasting promises. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of our longing, you know our deepest needs. By your spirit, gather our prayers and join them with the prayers of all your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Gathered into one body by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our well, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.